Martha Doris is going to talk about Government CX, the intersection of CX and plain language. We are so pleased to welcome her to our summit. Martha has almost 34 years of government experience in acquisition, technical, and program management to customer, customer experience. If you were wondering what CX means, it's customer experience. Martha has run many government organizations that build and deliver agency and citizen facing programs to deliver government services anytime, anywhere, on any device. So she has been driving the focus on customer, uh, customer experience across the government. For over a decade, she led the federal government's direct service to the public through USA.gov, GobernaroUSA.gov, and the National Contact Center. She increased the government's use of social media to deliver services as well. In addition, the Office of Citizen Services created communities of practice of which plain language is one and shared services such as Digital Gov Search and the Digital Analytics Program, DAP, that has built capabilities within agencies to deliver digital services. And since we owe so much of our energy and momentum Martha, to the plain language community of practice, let me start with the thank yous of, thank you for having the vision to create those communities of practice that make a lot of our work possible. Over to you, Martha. Well, thank you, Catherine. It's a pleasure for me to be here today with this, um, this community. As Catherine mentioned, I've been involved in government customer service and customer experience for a long, long time. And there's such an intersection between these two um, disciplines that um, we thought it would be great to kind of share um, with you where the government is today and how these these two kind of disciplines are intersecting. So um, to get started here. There we go. Um, we, we get a lot of questions about what is customer experience and there's, there's some myths around it. Uh, as you'll see here, the myth is around, uh, customer experience is about making people happy. It's around having a pizza party for your staff on Fridays so people are happy and they're more engaged and it's a better experience. And the real, the fact is that CX is a business discipline that places the customer in the center of everything you do, articulates a vision, guides how decisions are made, how employees are valued, how success is measured, and how services are designed. So there's many pieces to, um, to CX that um, it, it, it's really such an overarching um, concept that it, it touches almost everything you do. So it focuses on meeting the needs and expectations of the entire um, customer base within government as well as employees. And that can be um, patients through the National um, Cancer Institute. It can be travelers who touch many different services across the government. It can be small businesses. It can be families and children. It can be senior citizens. It can be farmers, ranchers, and producers. And it goes from the time they have a problem to solve through the completion of the transaction. It's one of the areas that really sets it apart from customer service, which is around that one touch point when you pick up the phone and make a phone call or you go on a website, customer experience is really that full end-to-end -end journey. It also brings into the equation around how people feel about the interaction or service. It's really everyone's job in an organization. Many agencies are creating chief customer officers and, um, and, they, and they, have, they have a role in, in the, you know, in of bringing customer experience practices to light and helping organizations but it can't be done by having a chief customer officer uh, alone many people think that you you know it's since it is everyone's job you don't need somebody in that role but in in reality it's everyone's job while everything's going well and it's no one's job when things are not going well so it doesn't happen by accident it really takes leadership focus and a willingness to empower employees to break down the silos. Many, in many cases, um, you know, each part and each silo does their job really well, but because they don't know what other steps are in that 
customer or citizen's journey, they, they can't really um, impact pack the full, they don't know the full journey. So um, it's, uh, it really, you, you hear lots of uh, conversations about, you know, especially in the, on the government side where somebody makes a phone call into a contact center and you know that that what the answer is or how you could help them, but the rule says, or in the situation in the VA where the rule said and the measure said this, but employees in many cases really know how to make things better. And so they need to be empowered to actually meet the needs of their customer base. And the, and the metric of success for CX is becoming um, trust in government. And it's, it's been demonstrated that in reality, you, a better service does increase the trust that people have in their government. So as I mentioned, it, the customer experience really starts with a vision or with a, with a problem and this public has a problem and it goes through um, the entire journey until you solve the problem and pass the end of the transaction. And because there's components of, of CX that people talk about around uh, governance and strategy and performance metrics and design thinking and I try to, you know, eat my own dog food here and put these things in plain language because I think we're finding that the customer experience community is talking in customer experience language and it's not really resonating with many people across the government. So it's really about having a vision for achieving, a, a vision and strategy for achieving the vision. It's like a blueprint. If you don't know where you're going and your agency doesn't have a customer strategy, with principles and values that go along with it. Everybody's doing their, their own thing across an organization. They don't have a, a, a North Star that they're going to in order to satisfy those um, customers of that agency. One story that comes to mind is around Disney when they started creating Disney land in California and all of the different workers were doing their thing and you had all this conflict brewing around the cast members and the engineers and the janitorial service. And in reality, what they had to do was, Walt Disney had to shut down Main Street, bring everybody together and explain what his vision was. And that whether you're emptying the trash or you're on stage or you're an engineer, you're all part of this vision that he had for bringing, you know, making it a place for families to have this experience on vacation. And so that vision is really a critical component to bringing all of your employees together and get, send, getting everybody to road together basically to the same place. Um, putting the customer at the center of your decisions and investments, which we've talked for years and years in the government about having a citizen-centered government or people talk about having a customer-centered agency. It's very easy to say customer and it's very easy to say have a cut, make, put the customer at the center of your organization. But until you really consciously talk about what would the citizen think? How does this impact the citizen? Is this investment helping to improve a pain point that the citizen has or your customers? Um, as I said, customers can be other agencies. It can be your employees. You know, if you're a small, at the Small Business Administration, it could be small businesses. So as I use customer, it kind of is interchangeable to other, all of these different um, types of people and personas. And in fact, one point there is that how you refer to your customers can sometimes make a big difference. Uh, to, you know, they, at Social Security, they're beneficiaries. At IRS, they're taxpayers. At the National Cancer Institute, they're um, patients. So it really does make a difference in how, um, in how you refer to your customers. How do you make decisions about customers? How do you measure progress and success? Um, designing services with the customer at the center. We have so much going on across the government around designing services, human-centered design, the user experience. And those are really all components of, as you're designing these services, bringing your customers into the process of, you know, coming up with ideas and helping to co-create and co-design um, services. How does the customer feel about the services they've just re received? And that's sort of how you measure it, you know, how you measure progress and success. 
how do they feel about it? You know, if they're if they're calling into a place, you know, do they feel that they've been respected in the in the um, their need that they have? Are are your agents empathetic to their needs? And in many cases, when people contact the government, this is in a very vulnerable time in their life when they really need us to be, you know, sympathetic and empathetic towards the needs that they have. And then how do you use that customer feedback to understand your customer's experience? Are you meeting their expectations? What are their future expectations? And um, how, how are you going to meet that? And so when you think about that and you think about it in terms of plain language, all of these things are, um, if, you, if you're creating content, whether it's whatever channel, and people don't understand what you're trying to explain to them or to tell them, that obviously doesn't meet the experience that they want to have. So I wanted to run through just a quick customer experience framework um, to keep in mind, really, a lot of it, the simple way to think about customer experience is, what are the expectations of your customers and what's the gap between their, their expectations and if you're meeting them? And so one, one way to think of, of it is in terms of plays, you know, understanding the current state of customer satisfaction and experience in your agency. Um, if you're a plain language, if you're a person in the plain language community and that's, you know, important to you, one, one way to connect to some, some of the things that are happening across government are the, is the focus on customer experience. And so they're looking at, you know, how do you, how can you play in, in that game um, in terms of the current state of your agency? Does your agency's culture, um, do you, do they have an appetite um, for change? And, you know, in many cases, you're working in an agency where, you know, things need to be changed, but people at the top or even at the middle don't, don't necessarily agree. And it's not unusual for people on the front line to really know that their things need to be changed. People at the top really want to change them and provide a different experience. But people at the middle don't really understand what the, what the reason is. And so um, this is really being honest about the appetite for change, because that may be where you need to stop and address that issue before you can even go, go any further. Um, build a customer-centric culture across the organization. If you're if you have a lot of you know all these pieces in place and you don't have a culture that doesn't that accepts the status quo and accepts that what you're doing is the best that you can do it's hard to move forward and and uh, and make improvements um, create a customer strategy that identifies the service gaps and how they'll be filled to meet the customer's expectations we mentioned that before um, uh, design a single organization that focuses on the customer if needed. Um, as I said, many, many agencies now have chief customer officers, GSA, Census Bureau, um, the VA, um, HUD is creating an organization, and there's some organizations that are creating chief customer officers to focus on internal customer experience, not, not external customer experience. So, Maybe there's not an organization, but you want to take that role of helping to bring that um, that information and and the need for that across your agency. Um, design the experience of the future. So what is that experience that you want to provide and develop a business case? In many cases, it gets um, stopped in this case where people don't want to spend money on it until they know um, that it, what it's going to bring, you know, the benefits that it's going to bring. And so actually developing that business case and then that continual measuring the, the improvements and continually um, making progress, measure and, you know, monitor, measure and, and uh, continually improve. And this can be applied. So when you take this kind of model and you think about like all of these pieces, you can apply that to employees as your customer. You can apply it to the way you do business if you do business with other agencies, the way you apply it to those services, or to external citizens if you have a citizen-facing agency uh, mission. On the right here, we, we, you know, we've added, okay, here's a lot of the, the customer groups, and on the left, um, the experience that people want, enjoyable, timely, accurate information, 
easy, trustworthy, private. Um, so you can think through like, what is that experience you're providing and what do you, do you wanna provide in the future? So to continue to kind of decode customer experience, because I think we're having a lot of um, disconnects, e even at very high levels in the government about what customer experience is. Um, customer experience, it is a business discipline. It's not just a nice to have. It's about the entire end-to-end -end journey, not just that single touch point. It's broader than customer service and includes, and I mentioned these before, governance, measurement, customer research, like understanding your customers, voice of the customer, organization and culture, and design. And um, under the cross-agency priority goal in the president's management agenda, agencies that have high impact services actually have to do a self-assessment in these areas and create action plans to address these areas. So, it's, it's beginning to get some legs in terms of uh, embedding some processes into the government and some, some uh, regulations and some connection and alignment with the budget process. CX is about meeting the expectations of your customers, includes how you feel about the brand or relationship with a company, organization, or agency, whether you use the term perception, perceive, or impression. This is where a lot of people really um, push back about this feeling um, component of it, but you know, human beings are feeling creatures, and regardless of whether you want them to or not, they have a, a response. And when you think about different brands across the government, whether it's IRS, Social Security, um, National Park Service, National Cancer Institute, people automatically have a perception in your personal life, whether it's Starbucks or Ritz Carlton or you know the USAA everybody has that feeling and that's where the branding and the feelings come in it applies to your your external customers and your internal customers as we've uh, mentioned before it's being it's um, becoming more widely understood that having um, good internal uh, employee experience really drives a good customer experience. Um, there's a slogan about happy cows give good milk because if you're, if you're miserable in the job you have and in the agency that you're in, you, it's very difficult to turn around and provide good service to customers. So customer experience is really, or employee experience, excuse me, is really critical to really driving. It's a big driver to um, providing outstanding service to customers. And again, it's everyone's job. It's not without its challenges for sure. Um, you know, the government is such a big organization and um, just to hit these slightly, it's um, the discipline of customer experience isn't, isn't consistently known at all levels. And the things that are, are um, asterisked here are challenges that were identified through OMB and the cap goal that they have on improving the experience that customer or that citizens have with federal services. So it is, a, it is an official PMA cap goal. Um, lack of accountability to improve the service levels provided to citizens. There's really nowhere in the government that captures the service levels that are provided. You can dig through um, performance.gov or you can dig into agencies websites but most of the time it doesn't say how many days it took to process that disability claim or how many days did it take to process that um, appeals request or to provide that social security card or or process that loan application um, there's a disconnect between the headquarters and field operations and this was brought up recently by um, Mark Foreman who used to be the very first federal CIO when we were Kind of discussing these challenges um, to talk to the industry people and he said field operations and people on the front line know what needs to be done and where they should be putting money and resources people at headquarters get get sidetracked with audits and igs and so they end up spending money to keep them you know out of the the headlines and then they don't get the money set aside to do the frontline um, 
improvements, which I had never really thought of it that way. Um, organizational designs and silos, you know, when you, if you're, if you were a veteran and you wanted to change your address, you had to call 11 different organizations within the VA, which is not true today, but it's only been within the last year to year and a half that they were actually able to create a profile of a veteran so that when you changed it once, it, it, it you know, went into all the different systems. If somebody's a veteran, um, they have a school loan or more than likely they'd have a, you know, a GI Bill loan or uh, use the GI Bill, or if they had some kind of housing thing or they, um, you know, obviously have a social security card. If you want to change your name, you have to call every one of these organizations um, individually. And so at important times of your life and life events, when things happen and you need to connect across multiple agencies, it's, it's very difficult within single agency, let alone across the government. Uh, the culture of service, it's, it's so hard to get things done sometimes and make these improvements, especially where there's data sharing that needs to be done or backend systems that need to be created, that people just accept that this is okay. So creating a culture of service um, is, is a, a challenge across the government. It's not, it's, um, CX is too often not a priority for leadership and staff at all levels. That was actually one of the OMB findings from talking to high impact services across the whole government. Program implementers don't necessarily have a deep understanding of their customer or their needs. Five years ago, if you ask somebody what their customers thought of their services, they really didn't even want to get feedback. You also have the issue of the Paperwork Reduction Act and getting a waiver for that. There's been a lot of changes that have happened to, to help improve that process, but still having an understanding of your customer is sort of the core foundation. Whether you're developing a website, even in plain language and understanding, you know, who, who are you writing for? Um, you're going to write differently if you're writing for social security recipients than if you're writing to, you know, more of a, a research and development community. Although I would say, you know, things like CDC and National Cancer Institute, everybody needs to be writing in language that we can all understand. Uh, frustrated employees won't provide an exceptional experience for the customer. That's a really nice way of saying the, the, the driver of employee experience. And then getting the right CX talent and services is, is hard. So they've made a big push at OMB recently to hire and use a new hiring process for CX um, people, primarily in the design space. So I wanted to give you a little sense of, and I'm not gonna go through all these things um, individually, but customer service and customer experience has been talked about since the, early, well, since the late 1990s in the Government Performance and Results Act. And almost every president since then has actually done an executive order or some focus on customer service, and it's only been in the last four or five years that we've, we've connected customer, or we've kind of morphed into the customer experience discipline, but it's also very new in the private sector as well. So there's not, it's not very much, um, it's not much training and there's no degrees really in customer experience, although it's starting to come, come out. Um, you can see here um, in the last two years, uh, Modernizing Government Technology Act really um, allows you to use savings from innovations and put it into a working capital fund to, and modernizing technology is one way to improve the customer experience for sure. A um, couple other things. Well, we've got the President's Management Agenda. Um, 21st Century Idea was passed in, in December of 2018, and that's really about um, improving government websites, you probably, and, and we definitely got the plain language um, words in there, and, and it's about implementing, you know, things that we've been trying to do for years and years and years, but now it's codified in legislation, gives the CIO responsibility for uh, digital services, and promotes the use of electronic forms and digitizing of, pay, of paper. And then some of the uh, delivering government solutions for 21st century uh, the reform plan and reorganization recommendations, that was all around 
Im improving those services through the rec reorganization recommendations. And you, you probably remember when there were lots of fights going on about they can't do this without legislation and they can't do that without legislation. And so a few of the things in there happened, but not that many of them. And that's when um, Margaret went over, Margaret Weikert from OMB went over and was the acting director of OPM. Um, so that's sort of, just to give you some context about what that was about. And then section 80 of A11, um, began in July of 2018, and they just actually um, have placed the second round of action plans on, um, on performance.gov. They get submitted to OMB each, each year and then uh, uploaded along with their uh, capacity assessments and their action plans and their uh, feedback data, excuse me. Um, you'll notice the Service to the Citizen Awards. Um, we started almost three, well, we just had the third um, service to the citizen awards program. And so each year we try to recognize people who have gone above and beyond to improve the lives of citizens through improved government services. So um, if you have people in your organization, you can go to service to the citizen awards.org and um, re you know, recognize or nominate. We haven't, well, the nomination form is out there for next year, but we haven't really started um, pushing it yet. We just just had the third um, one in September. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what do citizens expect from government. Um, and it feeds really nicely into, um, into the plain language. You'll notice, or hope you noticed, back in 2011, we did put the, the Plain Writing Act on there. And um, all of the pieces around, you know, plain language is so critical to really achieving almost everything that citizens want when they interact with government. So an omni-channel experience is really around being able to go onto a channel, make a phone call, you know, call the contact center, email, go onto a website, and not have to start over so that in most cases agencies all those channels are separated and, and they don't carry your information or your case over to another channel. But that's really starting, especially there's uh, federal student aid is starting to look at that, IRS is looking at that, um, USCIS. So it's really starting to take hold and it, it, it impacts the technology that you have um, and the way that you, um, the knowledge management and so on. Um, an end-to-end -end digital experience, COVID is really, um, exposed and spotlighted the need for all of us to be able to deliver services um, through an end-to-end -end digital experience. Does that mean that it's not, they don't have to pick up a phone? No, that's still considered a digital experience because, um, but, but they would like to be able to say, to answer questions, and they do answer questions about what's on the website or how do I do this. They want their, their um, transactions and the information to be personalized, private, and secure. They want to be want it to be um, easily understood or easily understandable, um, empathetic, and they they want to be able to solve their problem on first contact. If they go on the website to get information, they want to be able to get the information that answers their question, um, and and then um, they're done. Or if they pick up the phone and call, they want that agent to be able to answer that question in an empathetic way, and they want to get that information to be consistent across um, all of the channels. So why is it important? And um, customer experience is known, I mean, we have data to support all of these allegations and the benefits. And so as you tie into what's the importance of plain language, plain language is a driver of improving that experience and it helps um, promote customer loyalty or citizen loyalty. And people will say, well, that's not really important in the government context. It's more important on the private sector context. But if you have people who are interacting with your agency and are saying nice things about how easy it is to get this information, it also drives improved um, compliance with, with things like filling out your taxes or um, your, your Census Bureau form. Um, it increases revenue. Again, one thing that you know many people in the government don't think is, is critical or important um, in the government context, but 
I know GSA, except for a couple organizations, are cost reimbursable. You know, National Park Service takes in fees. USCIS actually takes in fees. All the shared services operations, they're, they're embedding customer experience into shared services, which I think has been a missing piece for many, many years. Because if you're an agency and you're going to turn over your business to a company or you're going to turn it over to a shared service in the government, you're going to want to have a good experience. You don't want a worse experience because it's probably not going to be that much cheaper than it was if you went to the private sector. So it, the revenue piece, I think, is still um, critical in the government space. It reduces cost. So when you answer or solve a, a citizen's question or problem the first time they call you, it keeps them from calling you 15 times and getting the same, uh, getting a different answer or trying to figure out, you know, well, they didn't really solve my problem last time. Let me call back and, and um, ask somebody else. Same with consolidating contact centers or consolidating websites so that you don't ha give different information across multiple websites. Um, increased voluntary compliance, as I uh, mentioned. Um, there's, um, they found that at, at um, the IRS for every you know, point that you improve um, customer experience or customer service, really, it increases the revenues into the IRS by like $46 billion. So it's really um, important to make it easy to understand. And one of the things that OMB has found also is that it's not necessarily the websites as it is the program. So having all of this stuff written in a way that we can all understand it is critical. It gives employees a clear direction on where they're going and vision, as we talked about before, the, the importance of vision. It improves internal services to employees. I know everybody's working from home. And, and how um, frustrating is it to try and conduct, um, conduct services with your agency internal and then the services don't work? I know from my, my time in government trying to do, you know, get approvals to speak at conferences or, you know, um, to go get training or whatever. It was so cumbersome. So having those things that are streamlined and make it easier for the um, employees and it saves them a lot of time and promotes productivity, improves employee engagement, and gives you this clear direction and a united vision. But the ultimate measure um, of, of citizen experience is trust. And through um, A11, they're now really talking about um, and added a trust question. So it's, it's, it's beginning to get more um, legs. Here's some data um, that came from some work that McKinsey did that says satisfied customers are nine times more likely to trust government. Uh, satisfied customers are nine times more likely to agree that agencies achieve their mission. They're dissatisfied customers are two times more likely to reach out for help three plus three or more times whether they call you um, you know call you back go on your website continue to um, to try and get that answer and then dissatisfied customers are two times more likely to express publicly that they're dissatisfied with the experience that they had long-term organizational success is 50 percent driven by its health and it's mutually reinforced by cx those are all um, grounded in data, um, and if you, it's um, the the source is on here. So if you want to look it up on the McKinsey website, so just to give you some bottom line about the importance of it to the government and the work that you're doing. Um, obviously, we're in the middle of an election, and so we don't know what the next administration, whether it's a Biden administration or another Trump administration, um, how they will address um, customer experience. Although we do have some, <coughs> um, some ideas on both sides. Um, delivering government service is not, is not a partisan issue. So I th we think that it's gonna be fine, um, but it's an administration priority. You can get information on performance.gov backslash CX, it's, it's filled with good information. It's a congressional priority, as you saw through the 21st century idea. It's, demonstrated, it's been demonstrated as a citizen priority through COVID-19. It's really shined a light on the gaps 
in agencies and, and agencies have been able to accelerate some of their IT modernization efforts that they had in place and in action in order to, you know, agencies that were not allowing telework and then all of a sudden they had to provide, you know, cell phones and computers and lots of uh, resources, cloud computing, their services are not in the cloud. So all these agencies that had kind of moved forward in their modernization efforts really had a much easier time. And it, it represents many business opportunities for, um, for the private sector. It's a critical component of the president's management agenda. So we talked a little bit about uh, the cap goal for improving the customer experience with government services, which I, then section 280 of A11 identifies high impact services and they select, they have to solicit customer feedback, do a capacity or capability assessment and action plans based on that self-assessment. And then it also brought in the 21st century idea into um, A11. And then it gives you 21st century ideas about meeting website standards, digital forms, electronic signatures, and give CIOs the responsibility for digital services. Um, so you'll have these slides. We I just um, updated them with the latest high impact service providers. These were identified by OMB as having uh, either volume of traffic or importance to the community that they serve. So like the trust, um, trust beneficiary call center for the Office of Special Trustee for American Indians doesn't really have a lot of traffic, but it is critically important to that community. And so you'll see they're narrowing down. It's changed over time. Um, they're letting agencies identify these high impact services. And then eventually I suspect they'll get expanded to um, you know, other services across the different agencies. This is what they use to measure the feedback from, um, from the citizens for those high impact services, service quality, the process, people, and then it gives you the drivers for those areas, um, the, the service effectiveness, the perception of the value for process, ease and simplicity, efficiency or speed, equity and transparency. And they give you sample questions that you can use um, to when you conduct feedback, you know, solicit the feedback. And then under the people side, employee interaction, warmth, helpfulness, this is where the empathy um, comes in. So kind of um, wrapping it up here, citizens expect to access government information and services that are easy to understand and use. Um, all website assessments use plain language to assess their usability. 21st century idea, um, requires the use of plain language and section A11 of, of section 280 really brings in the, the use of 21st century idea. So it's, it's really a very instrumental piece of delivering service to citizens and having, uh, you know, trust in government. Okay. Very, well, very interesting and illuminating. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, I'm sure you'll be delighted that there are lots of questions. Uh oh. So, no, 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 no. They're all good. Um, one question uh, is if management resists CX, what's the best approach to persuade them? Um, I, so I think there's a couple different things. Um, one is almost like mystery shopping or, um, oh, what's it called? The TV show, The Boss. Um, anyway, it's, it's really to let them listen in to phone calls. It, it's, um, I know I worked on a project at HUD and we did some mystery shopping, making phone calls and actually letting them see the kind of experience that undercover boss, perfect, yes, um, thank you. Um, letting them see what that experience really is. There's a huge disconnect between what government people think they're delivering and what, it, what citizens believe that they're delivering. And that's not a diss on government or citizens. I think it's just that you need to look at the services that you provide from the citizen's perspective 
to really understand that. And then it's to, um, I like to go through an exercise of what is the experience, look at the data that you have, what is the experience that we're providing, and then get leadership involved in identifying what is that experience that we want to provide. And if you want to provide a, an experience that's consistent across programs or that you provide accurate information or that it's, you know, you provide timely services, once you can get people to agree to that, then you can figure out what does it mean to provide those services and how are you going to measure that and what the, what the surrounding pieces are. So that's just a couple of thoughts. Well, we had some sort of get together with that. Uh, some of the questions are a little similar, but they're still interesting. Like, how do you convince leadership to make CX a budget item? And I would assume that you would have some insight on that as well. Um, I think making it a budget item, uh, it's, it's sort of like cybersecurity in that it's, um, it almost needs to be integrated into everything you do. And sometimes calling it out as customer experience. I mean, getting a feedback tool in place is in some cases an additional budget item. Mm -hmm. um, but, but how can you run a program or an agency if you don't know what citizens are thinking of your, of your, the services that you provide? So, um, it's, in many cases, I, and this is true, when we started the, the chief customer office at GSA, agency that we were create, we were using, um, consultants to do feedback in all the different services that were in the millions of dollar ranges. And so mm -hmm. we use, you know, centralized tool, and then we're able to save all of that money. And that's how we started the chief customer office about five years ago. So, uh, how, you know, starting to point out how you can actually save money through some of these um, CX initiatives, I think also helps you to, you know, okay, well, if we can save this, can we move it into this, um, this pot of money to, um, to do customer mm -hmm. experience? There's a lot of things like, you know, user-centered design and UX and CX and all of the in plain language that often end up being overhead. You know, they're, they, they're not budgeted and sometimes it's hard enough to get time for them. Um, another question, how do you balance the needs of two customer groups? Like the internal customer that wants to quickly issue new or revised policy guidance and the end user customer that needs to read, understand, and use the guidance? Well, I think that, you know, in many of these things are, there's always a balance and, and, you know, we go back to healthcare.gov and then, you know, people wanted to get a, a website up before it was ready. And so, you know, you come up with a date and it, it never serves anybody well to rush things in ways that it's not, you know, it's not done in, in a proper way. Does that mean you have to um, do it, you know, to the 150 degree? You can use, you know, agile, agile methodologies allow you to create an MVP, put it out, test it, use it, and then, you know, tweak it over time or pivot and change it over time, which I think helps to kind of balance that as well by using a different process. Okay, and can you explain the difference between the, the customer experience position and customer service positions? Do they blur? So um, I would say, you know, the title, um, in some ways doesn't really matter, but customer service in many cases are the people on the front lines who are answering the phone or, or um, working in a contact center. Um, customer experience is really usually at a department level and they are, um, the, the chief customer office really is about bringing data together across the whole organization, aligning an agency and all the leadership on the um, the values, the customer values, so that you have, you know, people across the entire organization, it, they could be putting um, critical elements into everybody's performance plan. So it looks at things at a much higher strategic level 
than a customer service um, position would. Usually a customer service position would be targeted to one specific channel, whereas a CX position would be looking at that full journey and what that experience is at the end of that journey to help people figure out how do you, who's using that service, how do you map that, you know, that entire journey and where do all the pieces fit in that you might be able to identify pain points and therefore solve that entire journey for that customer base. Um, I am just wondering, Martha, but would it be possible to say that uh, customer service would be tailoring all the responses to the customer while customer experience might be rethinking the journey or rethinking the solutions on a much broader level? Well, I think um, a customer service, it's definitely answering that question on that specific channel. Um, it might be, so an example is, is um, you know, for a cable company, if you um, are moving and you need to unhook your cable from one house and move it to a different house and you have to call one number to tell them that you're moving and then you have to call another number to get the boxes sent to you right. to be able to pack it up and then you have to go on the website and do this and then you have to call the cable company to get the get it installed in your new house and you've made five different phone calls and in reality every phone call they were very helpful and they gave you accurate information problem is you want to pick up the phone and and make one phone call if it's especially if it's the same cable company yeah. and just yeah. unhook it here and move it in there so mm -hmm. it's about simplifying that entire um yeah. journey and i think it's an, another story that i really love is around the mri machine and we get into this with the it teams around the technology and the importance of the technology versus the experience and so you know when they created the the um, I think it's Doug Dietz created this, the MRI machine. He tried to, he went to, you know, observe people using it and they were taking kids in to have the, an MRI and the kids were kicking and screaming going in there. The room was dark and dingy and there was nothing on the wall and there was big yellow tape and, and they had to sedate like 80% of the kids that, that got an MRI. And so he decided to bring together a design team that was made up of design thinkers and teachers and uh, children's museums and you know people who thought like that to redesign it and they turned those experiences into they painted rocks on the floor so that it was like they, they went into either a jungle scene or a spaceship or mm -hmm. and they made it an experience that the kids were so much more comfortable with that the next time he went to observe it the, the child was like, can we come back? And so yeah. he had, he had really changed that experience as opposed to just focusing on the technology. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've awakened some career interest um, in a federal agency that does not have a customer experience position. What qualifications are best for that chief role and where in the organization is this best located? HR, communications, it's usually, it's usually, well, it is different in different agencies. Um, the Census Bureau, it's under communications. That's not really a best practice on where it should be. It really should, should report to either the head or the deputy secretary of the agency because you're breaking down some silos of some, you know, across the agency that you need to, um, you need some horsepower up as a chief customer officer, but each one of these organizations is, you know, got positions, whether they're in design or data analysis and data scientists and um, human centered design where they're doing journey mapping and personas and mapping those, those journeys. So um, some of the big agencies um, are always looking for, for good people that, that they're kind of growing at this point. Mm -hmm. And our last question, possibly for today, maybe, um, how do you effectively measure customer experience? So um, A11 has a new process for collecting feedback. Um, some agencies are measuring customer satisfaction through CSAT scores. 
um, it goes back to that exercise around um, what is that experience you want to provide and then you know getting feedback from customers to be able to identify you can do net promoter score which is what they do in industry a lot some mm -hmm. customer satisfaction scores like the questions you know what is your overall satisfaction with this service would you recommend this service to you know a, a colleague depends on the service that you're trying to to measure if you're if it's important that it be easy there's an effort score or an easy you know you can um, look at how many people rate things as you know how good or bad it is in terms of effort that it takes to accomplish it and there's some there's some good books on measurement too mm -hmm. what are some of those books um you know i don't have them off the top of my head i could i can provide them to you um, um when convenient when convenient okay. sure does anyone else have trouble understanding and translating the language we use with each other within our organization particularly computer and business jargon. How do we change that? Well, I think in this, in the customer experience space, we have, we're really starting to, at least I'm getting some feedback around, especially when consultants go into agencies and they talk in their, in their CX language. Mm -hmm. And so I've changed some of it to just delivering government services or I saw one comment about not using the word citizen. I agree, we've had that customer citizen um, issue for years and years, and in many cases, we just use public. You know, um, I haven't used it, I haven't seen the term resident used before, but um, we do need to talk about it in a way that we can have the conversation and get and get everybody understanding. I mean, there's there's a ton of like statistical analysis that can go into, you know, looking at measures that matter most like what matters most to your customer base so it gets very complicated very quickly but at, at the highest levels it's really just about you know are you delivering service there's a lot of ho lo a lot of low-hanging fruit that we need that we can address before we get into really tough stuff mm -hmm. is there anything else you would like to say about plain language and citizen service or citizen experience i beg your i, I just think experience. it's 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 um you know we all have the um i think we have a visitor here <laughs> we all have a um I, when I was at GSA, I had a, a difficult time getting GSA to understand the importance of it, right? That's what got mm -hmm. me into it and trying to get the government to pay attention to it. Here we are 10 years later and we have laws and regulations and, you know, the president's management agenda about it. So I think there are ways to take what you've, um, you know, done for so many years in general services administration is what GSA is. Um, you know what you've done for so many years and be able to leverage it to improve the way your customer base interacts with your agency and one final question what if the culture isn't customer centric and it's more risk averse you know how do you how do you <laughs> how do you convince leadership that uh, customer experience is something they want to do well i think the culture is a big um a big rock in the road um mm -hmm. but i think people in the space um while i don't like to bring up a lot of regulations and omb guidance and because we do it because it's the right thing to do not just because right. there's regulations that tell you to do it but if you're a person who really wants to take that on having some of those regulations as air cover really helps. And so I would say, you know, getting involved, like the uh, act IAC has a customer experience summit on November 18th and 19th, that's free for government. And so we're going to have P like 20 agencies represented and we're going to talk about employee experience. And so I think it's a, it's just, if it's a topic that's in, that you're interested in, mm -hmm. just start attending things and meeting people there's a community of interest. 
Um, I think GSA actually has a, has a CX community of interest as well. Um, so, and I'm happy, you know, if anybody, you've got my contact information and uh, so feel free to give me a call if you have any questions. I'm happy to, I could talk about this all day long. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate that. We appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, for those of you who are interested in more about customer experience, we do have um, in the chat, Alex um, put in a link to the ACT IAC event that Martha mentioned. And we have also, um, earlier I did a link to the Dig, uh, to the communities of practice on digital.gov. And one of those is, I believe, possibly a customer. Yes, thank you. And uh, some links from to GSA's office. Now, thank you so much, Martha. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Annetta, who is, I hope, settling down but uh yes there she is thank you so much martha i really You're appreciate welcome. it thank you for for letting me um address this important um community wonderful we appreciated it so much very enlightening uh i am next going to introduce annetta annetta cheek who is has been a big plain language powerhouse for a number of years, and I'll let her explain that. Um, Annetta is an anthropologist by training and has a PhD from the University of Arizona. She worked for the US government from 1980 till until early 2007, and most of her federal career focused on writing and implementing regulations. She spent four years as the, as the chief plain language expert on Vice President Al Gore's National Partnership for Reinventing Government. Uh, she served as chair of the Center for Plain Language and in that position was a major force behind the passage of the Plain Writing Act. Now, as we've done before, uh, we'll let Annetta talk and then I'll uh, take questions from the chat. You'll want to unmute yourself, Annetta. It's always something. You're, there okay. you go. There we go. Okay, good. Uh, and as you can tell, I failed to get in the regular way and I'm on my phone. Uh, it looks like maybe the regular way is going to let me in and if so, I'll switch over. But for now, we're on my phone. So um, I'm going to talk mostly about the Plain Writing Act today, but I will also talk briefly at the end about the advertised topic, which is the international plain language standards. Uh, but um, Catherine thought that uh, this particular group would be interested in hearing about how the Plain Writing Act came about. And I can tell you all about that. And in fact, I'll go back a little bit before that. Uh, the current push toward plain language in the federal government started in the middle 90s. Uh, I was involved uh, in regulations at that time, and a lot of the people doing plain language in the federal government were involved in regulations, and I'll talk about them. There were some other people doing letters and so on, but um, uh, that's not where I came at it from, and that's not where this push started, so I'll talk mostly about regulations. So uh, a number of us had been meeting, talking about plain language regulations, and a desk officer at OMB named jo, um, excuse me, Don Arbuckle suggested that we put on a little symposium about plain language and regulations, and he helped us set it up at the White House Conference Center, and we called it the Plain English Forum. Um, we had about 60 people there, and they were very enthusiastic, and a bunch of us started meeting, at first we were meeting weekly. Uh, however, uh, that died within the first year and we went to monthly and we called it the Plain English Network. And that's what has evolved into the group that a lot of you are members of today, uh, the, Plain Ag the Plain Language Action and Information Network. And I'll tell you how the name got changed. So um, we were trying to do plain language and regulations and uh, President Clinton 
read a little piece in the newspaper, the Washington Times, in fact, and uh, asked what that was all about. Uh, meanwhile, I had been asked to go to President, Vice President Gore's Reinventing Government Office to do plain language there. Um, and so the task of uh, getting some information to President Clinton was passed on to NPR uh, and specifically to me and with uh, a couple other colleagues, I uh, put together a uh, notebook with 25 examples of plain language from around the government. And it was received very well by President Clinton and he asked for some event around plain language. So Vice President Gore came to us and said, we want some kind of event. And we thought about that for a while and decided the best kind of event would be around a presidential uh, executive order uh, requiring plain language that so we were aiming pretty high. We worked on that for a while and failed to convince the people at the White House uh, even though Clinton wanted this, failed to convince the people at the White House that uh, this was executive order worthy, uh, but we did uh, convince them to let us have a presidential memo. So we worked on that a while, and in 1998, uh, President Clinton issued a presidential memo requiring agencies to write in plain language uh, any documents that went to the public and also regulations. So that uh, gave us another big push. We worked under that for a few years and then realized that we had probably gotten as far as we were going to get without uh, something more potent and that we needed a uh, law. Now, of course, that was easier said than done. Uh, I was still a Fed at the time and federal agencies don't really like their employees trotting up to the hill uh, talking to congressmen, uh, but uh, I started out that way, and then uh, in 2006, a Republican congresswoman from Michigan, a, a Republican, I think I just said that, uh, came to us and asked us to do something about plain language and to uh, help her develop a law or a bill. So we had the Miller bill in 2005 and six, and there was a hearing, and then it sort of died. So then we were starting over. She was no longer interested, or maybe she wasn't even in Congress anymore. I don't remember. So we needed someone else to help us promote this initiative. Um, so we went looking on the Hill uh, at the beginning of 2007, and I had retired from the government uh, in large part because I couldn't continue trotting up to the Hill all the time uh, as a federal employee. Uh, and I had gotten in my 25 years and I was 62, so um, I was okay from that point of view. And we had founded the Center for Plain Language back uh, several years earlier, and so we used that as a vehicle. And when we went to the Hill, we had been told that uh, a good place to look would be for a freshman who was interested in small business. Uh, because plain language really resonated with the small business community. Uh, they had to comply with whole bunches of federal regulations that were impenetrable to them unless they hired an attorney to help them translate them. So pretty quickly, actually, we came upon Bruce Braley, who was a freshman from Iowa. And usually when you find someone to help you uh, with a law, uh, you're lucky if you get someone who uh, has a mild interest in it uh, and just thinks it would be a good issue for them to take on, a good issue from a political point of view. So we were extremely fortunate in that Bruce was a true believer. Uh, Bruce had been a trial attorney and he had long been an advocate of clarity in legal writing. So he was actually very happy to come upon us and find out that we wanted. Uh, to push for a law that had uh, uh, to do with plain language in government writing. Um, anyway, um, we worked with him and in the first Congress, I, I don't know if you're aware, but Congress has come in two year stretches. Each time you get a new number, you get a new Congress, 
and that lasts for two years. And if you've gotten something started <clears throat> during one Congress and the Congress ends, you have to start all over. You can't pick up where you left off. So we got a pretty good start on it in 2007 and 2008, uh, but we didn't get far enough along and we ran out of time and Congress ended and we had to just step back and start all over again uh, in 2009 with the next Congress. So uh, we started again and got quite a bit of support, got quite a number of co-sponsors, got it out of the House very handily with a very strong vote, uh, and then we got to the Senate. Well, the Senate was a little bit more of a problem, uh, took us a little longer, and we thought we had finally made it, and then uh, Bob Bennett, a conservative Republican from Colorado, uh, put a hold on the bill. And we were in that position for maybe six months, going back and forth with his staff, trying to figure out what it was that he wanted, because we couldn't really understand what he was telling us. And uh, finally, we got Bruce in to have a meeting with Bennett. Of course, Bruce was still almost a, a, a freshman, and Bennett had been there for many, many years, so he far outweighed Bruce in uh, prestige. But when we got to Bennett, in person, it actually turned out he didn't have that big of an issue. He had a couple small issues which we were able to resolve. And the one important issue was he didn't like it being called plain English because, or plain language, because that was associated in his mind with official languages and with having to translate government documents into multiple languages. Uh, and uh, so it became the Plain Writing Act because that's what Bennett wanted. Uh, it was a fairly simple thing to do, to give that to him, uh, to get him uh, on our side. And the other thing that he wanted, which actually was um, a positive, I think, in the long run, that in the language of the act, uh, in the definition of plain writing, uh, it says that plain Writing means writing that is clear, concise, well-organized, and follows other best practices appropriate to the subject or field and intended audience. And that appropriate to the subject or field and intended audience was language that Bennett wanted us to put in there. And uh, as you may be aware, the uh, sort of the bedrock of the definition of plain language today is that plain language is, is writing that your intended audience can understand and use. And so that intended audience principle that was introduced by Bennett was actually, I think, a very good one. Uh, and it's one that we rely upon today when we're trying, when we're telling people that no, plain language doesn't mean that you have to write it for everybody in the universe and that the guy on the street corner doesn't have to understand your regulation about veterinary medicine or whatever. It's only the intended audience that has to understand it. So uh, with that breakthrough, we were able to get it out uh, and passed. And I was fortunate in that the day that, the, that Obama signed the bill, I was in Lisbon at an international plain language conference. And uh, I was giving my paper at that moment when somebody came tripping down the aisle and came up to me and told me that it had been signed. And so I got to tell the, uh, the audience uh, that the American bill had been signed by the president. And uh, there was uh, a lot of enthusiastic response to that. Um, it was probably one of the most exciting moments of my uh, plain language life to be there, to be able to tell people that and to see the, the reaction because everyone felt that with uh, the US having taken that step that it would be easier for them to take uh, a similar step in their country. Um, okay, why don't I, Catherine, are you around? Or am I just talking to myself? No, nope, we're all You're here. Right. Okay, uh, good. Uh, so before I go on, move on to uh, the standards, why don't we ask if there are any questions? As, as um, Annette has said, are there any questions? Is there anything that... Uh, You'd like clarified? I'm I'm seeing a lot of chatted. 
compliments. Great story about the pass the 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 uh, announcing of the passage of the Plain Writing Act. What year was it signed? That was 2010. Yes. Right. Yes. That's that's why this is the 10th anniversary. A whole decade. Yeah. 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 What were some of the reasons given for the delays or not adopting the act, or was it all? Um... Uh, it's just the administrative process. Um, you know, a lot of the negativity uh, came from attorneys, uh, understandably. A lot of it came from government attorneys, so that even though it was a, uh, a Democratic Congress at the time, and we had a fair amount of support from the staff, uh, they were being told by uh, agency attorneys that it was burdensome and so on, which does bring up that point that one of the things that we really wanted to do that we didn't get done was to include regulations. They mm -hmm. had been included in the presidential memo, uh, but we had to give them up um, to get it through because we were running into so much resistance from government attorneys. Uh, you know, and we went back and forth on that for quite some time. Um, and that took up a bit of time. And then, you know, when we gave it up, then that was one hurdle passed, as it were, not successfully, but behind us anyway. Mm -hmm. So just things like that. Um, I, maybe I should tell the little story about the federal plain language guidelines. Um, uh, and, Some, and first, someone has already said that it's always a pleasure to hear Annetta. So we would very much like to hear this story. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, one of the things that the Penn group did, or the Plain group, oh, and I forgot to say that the time of the presidential memo in 98 is when the name of the group was changed. It was, still, it was called Penn up until that point, the Plain English Network, but uh, the Department of Justice told us we couldn't call the executive memo Plain English because that implied that English was the official language of the United States, which of course it is not. Um, the U.S. has no official language. So at that point, it switched from plain English to plain language. And then because of Bennett's influence, the bill switched to plain writing. Um, anyway, uh, in the first, the first effort, the uh, uh, seven to eight effort, there had been a lot of talk, a lot of meetings about standards. What were we going to do for standards or for guidance or whatever? And the inclination of the Hill people was to say, well, let's let every agency write their own. Now, I was not enthusiastic about that. I could just see big arguments between agencies, um, you know, Department of Justice wanting to use the word shall and everybody else agreeing to give it up and whatever. Um, but since that effort failed before, you know, we ran out of time uh, before we got it passed, but I knew that was going to come up again uh, in the next effort, the one that ended up being successful. And uh, I, I was about to have a meeting on it, and I hadn't been focusing on that issue because there were a lot of issues to focus on. So I hadn't been focusing on it, and I realized I had a meeting at like one or two o'clock in the afternoon, and one of the major topics was going to be standards. Well, of course, the Plain English Network had done this document called, I think, Writing Reader Friendly Documents. Uh, it was one of the first things we did as a group, and it was on the website. And the website, of course, was, uh, you know, it wasn't, it, it was on an agency website, but it wasn't anything official. Nobody gave us money for it. And the advantage of not getting money, if there is such a thing, is that if nobody's giving you money, nobody cares what you do within certain limits. You don't have to get permission to do things because you're not spending their money. So Miriam Vincent, who still deals with the website, uh, I believe, does she? Yes. Yeah, okay, so she's still doing the website and I called her up in the morning and I said, quick, Miriam, change the name of writing reader friendly documents to federal plain language guidelines and put a link on the homepage. So again, since it was you know, an unofficial thing, she said, okay, and she did it. And you know, 15 minutes later, there were the federal plain language guidelines on the website. So when I got to the meeting and, they, and we got to the issue of standards, I said, oh, look, we don't need to bother because this interagency group uh, has this website, here it is, and they have federal guidelines that have been put together by an interagency task force, blah, blah, blah. 
And they all said, oh, great, that's fine, we'll just use that. So uh, that's how we solved the problem of who would do what standards. And it, it just, it's sort of, it's an interesting story because it shows you how serendipitous some things can be if you're just, you know, you're there at the right time and you have the right tools and you can get amazing stuff done, um, you know, if you just think that you can. So, uh, and we still have those and they're still important and, and people around the world refer to them now. So uh, that was a, a good thing to happen. Uh, so Thank that you was so that much, story. Annetta. I have a couple of very quick questions, I hope, okay. until you talk about the international standard. Um, was the United States the first country to sign such a law? Um, to the best of my knowledge, Sweden, has a much older program in the government uh, that started in the late 70s, I think. Uh, and they have an office in the uh, Ministry of Justice, I think it is, that uh, specifically reviews all federal official actions like uh, regulations and laws and executive orders and what have you, and makes sure that they are all clear. I do not think that is based on a specific law. So okay. that would leave it with saying, yes, the United States is first. Uh, but before I actually swore on a Bible, I would need to check with Sweden. Well, we can always uh, send, send information out afterwards. But uh, what do you believe is the biggest plain language update or success in re recent years? Uh, internationally or in the US? I will leave it open to you. Uh, well, then I guess I would have to say uh, getting that definition of plain language uh, passed by the three major organizations that deal with plain language and then seeing that uh, or something very similar to that on websites from around the world. Okay. Um, uh, so. Yeah, that's what I would think. And that those three organizations are? Okay, well, th this, this is a natural lead into a discussion of the standards. Mm -hmm. So if nobody else has any questions about the act, then I can talk about the standards and in the process I will answer that question. Go on ahead. Okay. All right. So uh, on the international level, we have three organizations dedicated to plain language. One is Clarity, which is the oldest and the largest, although these are all tiny organizations. And Clarity was founded in England, and it is dedicated to plain legal language. Most of its members, well, 70% of its members say are attorneys, believe it or not. And they are the only one with ha that has a journal about plain language. So if you have any interest in uh, getting a journal about plain language, and I'll, it's, it's a lot of the journal articles are not really heavily legal in nature. Uh, you would be interested in joining Clarity. Uh, and then there's Plain International, which started in Canada. And that was more a group of people who did some kind of plain language for a living. Um, and uh, that's also become international in scope. And then uh, the third one, of course, is the Center for Plain Language, founded in Washington. And most of the founders were federal employees, myself included. Uh, right about, uh, I think we finally formed it in October 2003, I think was the birthday. Um, and we did that because we were wanting to get more involved in the international community. We were wanting to do this lobbying. Basically, we wanted to put on an international conference and, you know, a bunch of feds without any other uh, organization behind them can't do that kind of thing. We couldn't sign a contract with a hotel, for example. So we founded the Nonprofit Center for Plain Language, which is the one that a lot of you people may know from the report card and uh, the Clearmark Awards. So those three organizations uh, in, um, well, I'm not sure when, maybe 2007, 2008, somewhere around there, 
decided to form something called the Federation, the International Federation for Plain Language. It's really a glorified work group put together by those three organizations to achieve a series of tasks that the organizations all felt should be uh, done to further plain language and should be done jointly rather than individually by any one uh, of the organizations or by all the organizations individually. So it was an attempt to coordinate at least part of the international plain language effort. And we got together and developed a series of uh, topics that we thought should be addressed by this federation. And there was a, an issue of the Clarity Journal in 2010, I think it's issue 64, uh, but don't hold me to that. If you can't find it, um, write to me. And uh, it's, you can get it free on the Clarity website because it's old now. Uh, and in that, we laid out a series of topics that we wanted to take on. And the first one was an international definition of plain language. So we set out on that and that took us quite a while uh, I remember being on the small group that was sort of finishing off the effort and we went through 17 drafts of something that's, you know, really only a paragraph long. It was a truly horrifying experience and I can really say that one of the, uh, some of the worst experiences I've had in my professional life have been to try to work out language with a group of other plain language experts. Uh, it's, it's excruciating. Uh, it's worse than a bunch of lawyers. Anyway, uh, and so, and unfortunately, some of these people I was working with were also lawyers, so that made it doubly difficult. But we finally got that definition out, uh, and it was approved by the three organizations. Uh, you know, we can't say that every plain language person in the world likes it, but the three organizations agreed to back it, and it's on the um, Federation website and on the three organizations websites and on a lot of other individual country and organizational websites. Uh, and it's the one about uh, plain language is language that uh, your intent, in, in which your intended audience can find what they need, understand it and use it. Uh, wording differs a little bit, but those basic principles uh, hold. So the second task was to develop standards for plain language. And we had a little hiatus in there for a few years. I think people were exhausted by the effort to get the definition passed. Uh, so not too much happened until about, what, four years ago. Uh, and they asked me to become the chair of that. And I did that for the last four years and I've just given that up, thankfully. Uh, but anyway, my one goal for my period as chair of the Federation was to get the standards out. So uh, we formed the usual work groups and the work group, uh, Christopher Balmford, a lot of you may know him, he's an attorney from Australia. Um, Thank you. Uh, and a couple other people thought that we should try to do it through ISO. Now ISO, I don't know how many of you there know ISO, uh, it's the International Standard for Organized uh, International Organization for Standardization. And I do believe it started life as a place where they would write standards for things like electrical outlets and plumbing fixtures and hard stuff like that. But uh, since uh, at least the last, let's see, oh, 40, 50 years, it's gotten into other areas. And in fact, one of its biggest set of standards is the one about organizational management. So we decided we were going to go to ISO and see if they would do a plain language standard with us. And we're surprised to learn that one of their working groups is called Language and Terminology. It's their Technical Committee 37. Uh, and if you, you can look that up uh, under ISO TC 37 uh, and see the kind of stuff that they do. Mostly they deal with translations uh, and uh, hardware that does translations uh, and, and stuff like that. But they were delighted to get into the plain language world. And we are now well along with the, the plain language standards under the auspices of ISO. We have just turned in draft two 
and are in the middle of a six week review period um, with, the, with our work group. Uh, and we're hopeful that this, you know, there might be a two and a half, version two and a half that has some relatively minor changes after this review period. Uh, and then we might get around to voting on a final document uh, by the middle of next year and by fall, uh, maybe about a year from now, have official plain language standards issued by ISO. Uh, the advantage of going with ISO is that a lot of organizations know ISO. A lot of organizations that have never heard of plain language are very familiar with ISO. And if there's an ISO standard, uh, a lot of those organizations just assume, well, it's an ISO standard, we need to comply with it. So we're hopeful that an ISO standard for plain language will be uh, far more uh, impactful than one that comes out from a group of admittedly not very powerful plain language enthusiasts. Now, because ISO standards all have to be uh, applicable to all the members of the group that is putting it out, the, uh, which would be TC37, uh, this has to be an international standard, which is what we wanted in the first place. So it's not something that says prefer active voice, use bulleted lists, uh, and so on. It's written at a higher level about understanding your audience, understanding what the audience needs, making sure you include the information that your audience needs, making sure they can find the information, and so on. And then hopefully, uh, plain language experts in various countries will want to do their own internal, more technical documents like the federal plain language standards, or guidelines, excuse me, um, that are consistent with the ISO standards. But we're hopeful that this will move uh, plain language ahead uh, internationally in the way the Plain Writing Act moved it ahead in the US. And I cannot share that document because of ISO's requirements. ISO does sell standards. That's how it makes its living. Um, you know, it funds these working groups, it funds Zoom, uh, it funds some travel, uh, and it gets the money for that by selling the standard. So when all is said and done, you'll have to buy it. Uh, and as I said, ISO requirements prohibit us from sharing it with anyone who is not on the working group developing it. But it has gone out, all three organizations, uh, Plain, the Center, and Plain International, the Center, and Clarity are what's called a liaison organization, so they have been allowed to share it with their members and ask their members to comment on it during the six-week comment period. So it's out there pretty widely uh, if you look for it. Well, that's great. That's, that's um, gotten all sorts of complimentary statements on the, on the chat. Very excited for the presentation. What an accomplishment, people say, and uh, very excited for the ISO. We certainly do get a great deal of that in the government, honestly. Oh, it just yeah. Is, yeah. So um, I have, based on your presentation, Annetta, yeah. um, I have two ideas. Number one, our new slogan will be plain language practitioners we're worse than lawyers yep, yep. and yep and when the when the um s definition gets approved the standard gets approved we should all get t-shirts yeah well you know we were thinking about the federation putting out t-shirts in fact yeah yeah um, yeah yeah I'll, I'll remind people about that. Um, we're going to have a Zoom meeting here in a couple of weeks uh, of the Federation. Um, and the new chair wants me to be on it. I'm still the chair of the Standards Committee. Uh, uh -huh. So I'll be with this effort till it's done. And then we already have identified the next standard that we will work on, and that's going to be plain legal writing. Ah, well, that that will be that will be an accomplishment uh, devoutly to be wished. We have, yep. uh, yeah, there's certainly enough inquiry about um, about regulations that uh, yep. and plain legal writing. So I can very much see the um, now. Now, what we have now on the chat is a lot of enthusiasm 
and recommendations on the t-shirts. So um, <laughs> send them along. Yeah. Send them along. <laughs> uh, uh, a pious wish. I hope your day is a bonzer one. So I'm I'm interpreting that as a wish for everybody. And uh, what's the role of PhD scientists in communications moving ahead in this administration? This administration. I hope I hope their role is short. Ah. <laughs> Uh, um, well, I mean, I'm a PhD uh, in, you know, and I was in the administration, so they could all do what I did, which is advocate for it. Uh, and first, they have to make sure they can write it. Actually, that's not true. I know a number of plain language advocates who unfortunately do not write very well, but they know that they should write more clearly than they do. Um, uh, that turns into what is it the the curse of knowing that your writing should be clearer not right. quite the curse of knowledge but uh right. it could always be better well many many thanks anetta for all of Glad this and very happy to get a chance to look at the history because you know people ask me and i'm like uh i don't know because i don't think <laughs> i got into plain language until about 2012 Right, and right. so it's like uh, something happened, you know, but to get the insider track is is uh, really, really valuable. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And speaking of the insider track, I think we will also move to Joe Kimball. So I believe that that is that is where we are. Yes. Oh, oh Annetta, a final compliment great context and motivation to keep improving. I don't know whether they're still talking about the t-shirt. Oh, and you have a hashtag, you lucky person, Team Anetta. So, yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Hi, Joe. <laughs> hey, Anetta. Hi, everybody. Okay. Hello. Okay. So, well, uh, just if anybody wants to write to me with questions, I'm glad, uh, uh, I'm glad to take that on. You know, I only get 100 or so emails a day, so a few more won't hurt. We can definitely increase that. If you'd like to contact us with a qu question for Anetta at info at plainlanguage.gov, we will happily forward them to her. Can't say whether she'll answer them as happily, but I bet she will. <laughs> I bet I will. I bet okay. I will. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. See you later. Thank you. And Joe. Thank you so much. And I should be a little bit more formal as you talk about the, the how did you put it, the 30 years of, um, no, I'm going to get it wrong because I'm trying to remember it and I shouldn't, I should read it properly off the screen. Let me, let me give your background before we move uh, forward to that. Professor Kimball has taught legal writing and drafting for more than 30 years at Western Michigan University Cooley Law School. He now provides seminars for legal and business organizations, KimballWritingSeminars.com, and has lectured throughout the United States and abroad, published many articles on legal writing, and written three books, Lifting the Fog of Legalese, Essays on Plain Language, The World Famous writing for dollars, writing to please the case for plain language in business, government, and the law, and seeing through legalese more essays on plain language. He is senior editor of the Scribes Journal of Legal Writing, the longtime editor of the plain language column in the Michigan Bar Journal, editor of the Red Lines writing column in Judicator, a past president of Clarity, and a founding director of the Center for Plain Language. And since 1999, he has been the drafting consultant on all U.S. federal court rules and has received several national and international awards for his work. And he's been a huge supporter for Plain. So, Joe, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you. Can you see, can you see me and hear me? Yes. Okay, I can't see myself, but maybe it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> So I will, I will start. Uh, it is the end of the day, and I know you probably are all a little weary, so let's go. And most of my, most of my talk will involve screen sharing, so let's hope that I can make that work. 
before the, you will have this in your email, a handout, which I assume you have not looked at yet. And here it is. It is all of these 30 items that I'm going to talk about uh, with my answers, short answers. They have to be short, there's 30 of them. Right? And, but there you will find references. If you can see me pointing to the footnotes, you will find references throughout that you can use to do further study research. You can dig in deeper uh, if you want to. So that's the handout that is waiting for you, I believe, in your, uh, in your email. But that's not what I'm going to use today. I'm going to go to another item. And that's the title of my talk. Flimsy, flimsy claims for legalese and false criticisms of plain language, a 30 year collection. 30 years I've, I've been at this. And for your perverse enjoyment, 30 flimsy claims for legalese and false criticisms of plain language. Maybe that should have been bogus criticisms of plain language. Uh, some of you may have heard this some of you may have heard this talk before. I gave it at the Clarity Conference in 2018 in Montreal. If you've heard it before, well, lucky you. <laughs> Obviously, I can only highlight some of these uh, criticisms. As I say, you have a handout with my brief responses, but as you saw, everything has references so you can dig deeper if you want to. I cite myself a lot in the footnotes because I've been taking on these criticisms many times and for many years. So, and, and, and again, the references will, will in turn take you to lots of other uh, sources that I cite. I know that you know all of this, or most of it anyway, but it's, it's kind of interesting to catalog it. And now you'll have a handy list. Maybe you can even add to it. Maybe, maybe when I come back in, in 10, in 10 years, there'll be 40. Although, you know, I'd much rather that they, I'd much rather that these die out. Emphasis, emphasis on them, not me. Some of them have more weight or substance than others, but they all come up. They've come up, they came up this morning in the chat, some of these, uh, some of these claims and criticism, and I think they need to be answered. Some are more challenging though than others. I've heard it said that we shouldn't be repeating these false claims, these flimsy claims and false criticisms, and that repeating them gives them life. And there's something, I suppose, there's something to that. So I try to keep it in mind when the situation allows, rather than saying plain language does not dumb down, say something positive like plain language has a long literary tradition or some such positive statement. But in the end, you know, I think that much and, and, and probably most of the negativity, at least from lawyers and probably from others, is a product of uh, more than anything, inertia, habit, um, inflexibility, obtuseness, uh, and that these are just mostly uh, excuses. So let's run through them one at a time. I'm going to do these in four categories. The first category is exaggerations about traditional legal language and legal drafting. Number one, and this is a quote now, and you'll, you'll, you'll find the source of the quote in the, in the footnotes in my handout. This is a quote that appeared in the, in the Michigan Bar Journal. The great protectors of the integrity of the English language may be found in only three spheres, the ministry, the Senate, and the legal profession. Uh, yeah, uh, right, the, the, the glory of traditional legal writing. In fact, of course, the critics, the critics of traditional legal writing are legion and far outnumber its, its defenders. I'll give you just a couple of quotes, my all time, my absolutely, my all-time favorite qu quote is from Professor John Lindsay, used to teach at Temple, who says, law books are the largest body of poorly written literature 
ever created by the human race. <laughs> the largest body of poorly written literature ever created by the human race. How about that? Uh, the great Fro Fred Rodell from Yale said, there are, there are two things wrong with almost all legal writing. One is its form, the other is its content. That, I think, about covers the ground. And I'll give you one more from Carl Felsenfeld, who said, lawyers have two common failings. Lawyers have two common failings. One is they don't write well. Two is, the other is, they think they do. Traditional style has been defined and refined by first-rate minds over the century. Now, this comes from a persistent critic of plain language, he who is named in the uh, footnotes. And because he's a, a sort of been a critic over the years, uh, journalists will go to him for the other side, if you will. And it happened in this, uh, in this 2017 online article. You can look it up. Uh, where the journalist went to him and said, well, what about all this evidence that Kimball has collected that shows that readers prefer plain language, works better, saves money, so on and so forth. And he said, I'll get this. What is the worst possible response you can give to something like that? His response was, I don't read Kimball. <laughs> See, there you go, obtuseness. The law has any, any number of irreplaceable technical, not just the law, I mean, I'm sure in your own work too in, in, in the government, there's this, there's this idea out there that there are any number of irreplaceable technical terms that have been honed to a fairly settled, precise meaning. Now, this is, one of the, this is one of the more challenging ones for us. And I've spoken about this at other uh, conferences and other venues, but very briefly, I'll just say here that the law, uh, the, uh, these so-called terms of art are more rare and more replaceable and more imprecise than lawyers like to think. But of course, dealing with them for consumers may require a few additional words of, of explanation in a consumer context. Statutes and regulations often specify that certain language be included in legal documents. I'll bet some of you have heard this from the lawyers in your departments or offices, right? Well, that's true. It sometimes does specify certain wording, but very often, and I think more often than not, it doesn't require specific wording. It doesn't say use these words. It, it, it will say something like, you must provide the following information, or you must use the following or equivalent, or equivalent wording. Or it'll say, you must provide notice in substantially the following form, and none of those equal use these words. If you run into this, I recommend that you, if you're in a position to, I recommend that you ask for a citation and look it up and see for yourself whether it really does require certain fixed language. Lawyers are by training skilled drafters. Well, it may surprise the non-lawyers here to learn that lawyers don't get a lot of training in legal drafting or haven't at least until fairly recently, the last 10 or 20 years when law schools started to develop more classes in legal drafting. And 10 or 20 years is a short time as far as legal language goes. Um, and even then, it's only in a few uh, courses. So the fact is that most lawyers are not skilled drafters. Um, and Law schools have not done a good job of teaching this fundamental skill. And so what do many or most lawyers do when they go out to practice, especially maybe some of the older lawyers? Uh, they copy the forms. They copy the lumbering old forms that are already out there. And so this stuff just perpetuates itself from year to year and generation to generation. So here's my response to this first set of criticisms. <laughs> you must be kidding. 
lawyers are skilled legal drafters. Some are, some are. Second category, plain language as elitist, prescriptive, moralistic, and inflexible. This is a set of criticisms that is truly strange. From a fairly new critic of plain language, I answered, she wrote an article a few years ago and I answered it a few years ago. My answer is collected in, uh, in, the, in, in my latest book, uh, Seeing Through Legalese. She made a series of claims in a, fairly, in a fairly prestigious journal, but hardly cited any advocate who says, who has said what she accuses us of. Almost no citations to the plain language literature, which is all, unfortunately, all too common. She did cite me once, but in a way that misrepresented what I said. So let's run through these. Advocates are trying to purify or control. This is a quote. Advocates are trying to purify or control language use. I don't even know, I don't even hardly know what that means. We're trying to purify or we're trying to make it more understandable to readers. We have some suggestions and, and, and guidelines, but nobody's trying to control language use. Advocates believe that, quote, legal style is in a state of decay and on a downhill path. Well, no, we think it's uh, already at the bottom of the hill and has no place to go but up. Now, look, I'm speaking generally, of course. I mean, there are good legal writers. There are lots of good legal writers uh, out there and legal drafters, but unfortunately they are overwhelmed by the great majority of not so good or even poor legal writers. Advocates don't recognize that language is in a constant state of change. Now, Come on, we are not so benighted. I mean, we know that language uh, changes. We know, we know that it's not frozen in time. And, and, and none of us should be clinging to usages that have changed. We understand that, you know, there may still be some resistance on this, that, that they has become an acceptable uh, singular pronoun, singular use of they. Um, but we understand, of course, and have for a long time that, uh, uh, the, he is not generic. Uh, you know, some of the old usage uh, books used to say, don't use contact in the sense of get in touch with. But that's long since, you know, that's long since an acceptable usage. If there's any advice on this, I think the best advice comes from Alexander Pope, who said, be not the first by whom the new are tried, nor yet the last to lay the old beside. So you don't want to be at the front edge of the curve, but you don't want to be lagging way behind either when it comes to usage. Advocates are prescriptivists who believe in a standard language ideology and wish to stigmatize or exclude anyone who uses language improperly. See, this is what we get. This is what we get for trying to help people, trying to help readers and users. Plain language is inclusive, not exclusive. We believe that public documents, public information ought to, be, uh, ought to be understandable by the greatest possible number of readers and users. Advocates believe that plain language is linguistically superior and morally superior to legalese. Linguistically, because it is more clear or understandable. Well, it is. And there's lots of evidence to show this. I don't know if we call that superior, but we might say that it works better for most readers. Morally, because we once contemplated incorporating honesty into a definition of plain language and are concerned that legalese can be used to deceive and manipulate. Let me, let me at this point just say, I've never thought, and I don't think, and I've written that there is this great conspiracy among lawyers to perpetuate legalese or to keep their clients and readers confused. I don't think it's a deliberate conspiracy. I think that the reasons for tradition, traditional legal writing uh, not changing as fast as we would like it to, the reasons had to do with habit, bad habit, you know, inertia, lack of skill and training, and those poor models that I mentioned earlier, all those, all those lumbering, turgid old forms that are out there that lawyers just tend to, just tend to copy. 
Language guardians like us, presumably, often portray certain styles and usages as signs of stupidity, ignorance, perversity, moral degeneracy, etc. Well, again, nobody uses, none of us use language like this, right? And again, she doesn't cite even one plain language uh, expert or authority or resource that uses language like this. I mean, clinging to, clinging to legalese and clinging to officialese may be stubborn. It may be closed-minded, uh, but people who do this are not, are not moral degenerates. So this is my response to this category. What are you talking what are you talking about? Third category, constricted views of plain language. Now we come back to our, again, when you get the, when you get the handout, you will see this, you know, the citations to, in the footnotes. We come back to our longtime critic of plain language saying things like this. Typically, there are a list of 10 or 11, 10 or 12 plain language rules. Well. Of course, first of all, they're not rules. They're guidelines, they're recommendations. And there are dozens of them. As again, anybody who has looked at the literature would know. Uh, go to any good book on plain language writing or the federal plain language guidelines and you'll find dozens of uh, recommendations. You may, you may occasionally see somebody list 10 or 12 that that person thinks is especially important, but that doesn't mean that's, that's all there are. Plain language often requires compressing what might be a complex policy into a small number of words. Well, of course, again, there's no such requirement. Now, that will usually be the result of a plain language project, and I think anybody that's worked on one will, uh, will attest to that. Uh, that's usually the result, but you set out to write it as clearly as possible uh, in as few words as possible, consistent with accuracy. Right? When I, I was involved in rewriting the U.S. federal rules of civil procedure, and that was a long project over several years, and in the end, we reduced the overall word count by uh, 14%, even though we had more than twice as many headings in the new federal rules of civil procedures, one of the biggest improvements in the revised federal rules of civil procedure, more than twice, more than twice as many headings as in the, uh, as in the original. Advocates command that short sentences be used. <laughs> Nobody commands. We say, prefer short and medium length sentences. Shoot for an average of around 20 words sentence. Average, average, average. Doesn't mean if your average is 21 or 22 or 23, it's not plain language. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Advocates have a rule to address readers as you in statute. Again, no such rule. We say try to address your readers uh, for, in consumer documents. Try to address your reader as you and refer to your organization or your agency as we. Puts the reader directly into the picture. Might not always be able to do that, but there's no such rule, but it's certainly, a strong, it's certainly strongly recommended when possible. See, the, what's going on here? These are guidelines and preferences turned into absolutes, which they're not. The most damaging, plan, catch the capital P, capital L, the most damaging plain language rule is to write only words that are commonly understood by lay people and ordinary, in ordinary speaking and writing. Well, again, if you, all you have to do is look into the books and you will see that it's a preference only, prefer everyday words that your readers will uh, easily understand. But by all means, if you think uh, another word is more precise or you have a good stylistic reason for using it, then use it. Now, the plain language movement has degenerated into a verbal witch hunt in which the goal seems to be attack, 
seems to be to attack harmless phrases in any legal writing with the vigor of Moses crushing the golden calf. <laughs> this again, this, this is a quote right out of the Michigan Bar Journal. The time it takes to comprehend a few extra words is trivial. Well, look, we've gone after some uses that we think are especially egregious, shall, provided that, you know, in, in, in a proviso, and slash or acronyms and all the old formalisms of legal writing, like know all men by these presents and further affiant say and not the silly stuff in witness whereof, but you know, we, we go after those more, more than anything, just kind of as a prod to action. I mean, at least start here. Uh, and the time it takes to comprehend a few extra words is trivial. Of course, that's true. But the time it takes to comprehend a few extra words here and a few more extra words there and so on and so on adds up, right? And is not so trivial. As we heard this morning, for advocates, clarity is measured by readability formulas, and it's just not true. Very few plain language advocates uh, say that readability formulas are the ultimate measure of uh, whether a document is clear or not. They may have value, some value. They may have negative value. I don't know what Ginny will think about this, Ginny Reddish, who has written about this quite a bit. They might have negative value. If you score poorly on a readability formula, there's a pretty good chance that maybe you need to revisit and rework the documents, but scoring well on a readability formula doesn't guarantee, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the document is, uh, is clear. And as we all know, the gold standard is user testing whenever possible. So this is my disgusted pose. I'm tired of hearing this. <laughs> Finally, the last set of uh, the, these constricted views of plain language. All right. Finally, last category, other distortions and misconceptions. Advocates believe it is more important to be clear than to be uh, accurate. This is one of the, the big ones that we stress, that we sacrifice accuracy for clarity. And it's not true. If we don't always say that plain language has to be accurate, it's because we take it to be blindingly obvious that, we, that, that, that in doing a plain language rewrite, you can't change the substance, you can't change the meaning. In fact, we say that clarity and accuracy, this is important, clarity and accuracy are complementary goals. Clarity, clear style, sharpens substance every time. And I think anybody that's in, been involved in the plain language project will tell you that, that you will uncover all kinds of ambiguity and uncertainty and inconsistency and confusion that was hidden beneath the dense surface, surface of, the, uh, of the old document, related to 19. So they are complementary goals. They are not necessarily competing goals, but of course what we do has to be, uh, has to be accurate. Plain language generates errors. It's not accurate. Uh, it's not accurate or uh, precise. There's this, there's this game that critics of plain language like to play, the gotcha game. You've done a major, say, plain language rewrite. And somebody, well, that's a critic of plain language will go through it trying to find error. See, and maybe on page 15, you might have changed the meaning. Never mind the huge improvement that you made and all of the ambiguities and inconsistencies that you fixed uh, while you were doing the, doing the project, you might have made an error uh, uh, over there on, on, on page 15. Well, first of all, uh, typically you're gonna catch it during the rewriting process and the fix is uh, typically uh, pretty easy. And second, as I'm, as I'm suggesting, 
I mean, the critics would be rather dismayed if they applied the same level of scrutiny, scrutiny to, uh, to old style documents. They would find all sorts of trouble. A concept expressed in plain language will not always care, carry a clear and unambiguous meaning. Some words are designedly imprecise and permit of a subjective, subjective interpretation. Words such as satisfactory, necessary, fair, reasonable. Now this is one, you know, that, that again comes up. By the way, those words are not ambiguous, they're vague. There's a, there's, there's a, big, there's a big difference. And we have, to, all natural language is vague at some point. We have no objection to words like satisfactory, necessary, fair, reasonable, as long as they're not over vague, too uncertain. I did a little experiment with the first six rules of the federal, this is, this is legal, I know. The first, uh, the first six rules of the federal rules of criminal procedure. Just, just picking out, just picking out vague, not ambiguous, vague words. Examples, unjustifiable expense, essential facts, reasonable availability, with reasonable certainty, promptly, extraordinary circumstances, probable cause, good cause. And that's only about, that's only about half of them. You can't avoid vagueness in any kind of writing. Uh, the, the, the goal is, is not to be, on the one hand, too vague, and on the other hand, too precise. And it's a tightrope. Most of the advocates are not professional drafters, but academics and others who may never have drafted a bill. Well, in fact, the, to take, for instance, the Commonwealth Association of Legislative Council, uh, a big group of over 2,000 professional legislative, legislative drafters have for some time now um, supported plain language, talked about it at their conferences, uh, articles about it in their, in their publications. And so there are lots of plain language advocates among professional legislative drafters in Australia, in, New Zealand, in their style manuals, their style manuals uh, pay a lot of attention to plain language guidelines and plain language techniques. Australia, New Zealand, I'm leaving out countries obviously, but Canada, I'm afraid though that the US congressional drafters may be lagging behind some of the drafters in other countries. Advocates believe that citizens read statutes and that everyone has a right to understand them. Now this is a, this is a some, again, is a somewhat challenging point for us. We, I think our, I think our approach to this should be that somebody who is reasonably literate and motivated should be able, should at least have a decent chance of understanding a statute or a regulation uh, that affects him or her, them, right? And so when we talk about being clear to our audience, I think implicitly, uh, our intended audience, we, we must mean implicitly the great majority of our intended audience. Not everybody is going to be able to understand everything, uh, every statute or every regulation, but we should be aiming at the great majority of our intended uh, intended readers. The primary audience for our laws is lawyers. We should concentrate on making them clear to, uh, we should concentrate on making them clear to lawyers. This see is the, the priestly view of law, right? Only the priests can understand. Only the priests can understand law, right? Uh, and at some point it becomes an excuse for the, the status quo. Besides, we haven't even done an especially good job of making laws and regulations clear to lawyers themselves. The way to make statutes clear to citizens is to provide separate explanatory guides. That's all fine, well and good. You know, provide separate explanatory guides. But why? Uh, why not make the law as clear as possible to uh, begin with? This isn't a one or the other, either or choice. 
readers expect to see legalese and officialese in those kinds of documents? Well, they may, but they hate it. And there's lots of evidence uh, in, on that. And if indeed they do expect to see legalese and officialese in those kinds of documents, then shame on the writers who have conditioned them to expect it. Plain style, now this is a biggie, plain style is not more consistently effective than other styles. The rules for employing plain English remain a grab bag of unsupported admonitions. Well, in fact, there is evidence that plain language is more consistently effective than other styles. And folks, I've collected it in, and I'm not, I don't mean to be self-promotional here, but I've collected it in, I don't know if you can see it, writing for dollars, writing to please, Summary, and, and by the way, the subtitle for this is The Case for Plain Language in Business, Government, and Law. And I summarized 50 empirical studies, and it's full of data and numbers and cost savings. I mean, I think if you need, you need to make the case for plain language in your organization, this might not be uh, a bad place to, uh, to start. Uh, by the way, uh, we're running a little bit low, but, in, in, but we're doing another print run. So if it's not available um, right away, it will be in, in a few weeks. As for the individual rules for, play, for plain English, active voice and so on, strong verbs, um, there is evidence to support those that, we haven't studied all of them individually, uh, but there is evidence to support uh, support the ones that have been studied, and that evidence, again, is cited in, in the footnotes uh, in your handout. Plain language, ah yeah, here we go. Plain language is dull and drab. It dumbs down, it's simple-minded. We advocate the writing style. This again, <laughs> Michigan Bar Journal, we advocate the writing style of a fourth grader. Of course, it's not true. And as people have said in the chat, nobody complains that a document is, uh, is just too clear and they're offended because it's too clear, right? And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, plain language has a long literary tradition. Abraham Lincoln, Winston Churchill, George Orwell, E.B. White, a lot, it can be, it can be powerful and expressive in the right context. I mean, you may remember, Juliet speaking of Romeo, when he shall die, cut him up in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. I'll do it once more. When he shall die, take him and cut him up in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Almost all monosyllables. Advocates assume that all writing is the same. Well, look, this is so absurd that it doesn't even deserve a response. Advocates assume that all writing is the same. But there, there it is, somebody says that. Anybody can write in plain language, it's easy. Well, as we've talked about here today, yeah, if only it were so easy. You know, if, if it were so easy, you'd see a lot more of it, right? It takes, as you all know, it takes practice, it takes, it takes reading, it takes critique, uh, and uh, it takes skill in the end. You know, a, a good writer makes a, 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 a tough piece of writing look easy the same way a good athlete makes a tough play look easy, but of course, immense amount of skill goes into it. One of my, another one of my all-time favorite quotes is from Jacques Barzin, who said, plain English is nobody's mother tongue. It has to be worked for. So that's it, that's 30, and here is my response to this last set of criticisms. This is my exasperated post. I'm tired of hearing the plain language dumbs down. Okay, I think I stopped the screen sharing at this point. 
and just have a couple of wrap-up comments. Any reform movement, any reform movement, especially one that takes on the gigantic task, a gigantic task of reforming public communication will face doubters and critics. But as Christopher Bomford, one of our veterans, our plain language veterans has said, the intellectual battle, the intellectual battle is over for anyone who cares to look into the matter, anyone who cares to look into the literature. But for the remaining critics and doubters and undecided, you've got the answers if you need them. Be confident, be engagingly bold, even though the task is daunting, along with the answers, and I hope the energy and the perseverance, you've got the skill or are acquiring the skill. You know, as I just said, only the best minds, only the best minds and best writers can pull off plain language. Only the best minds and best writers can pull off plain language. That's, that's you. And I am proud to be in your presence today and to make this, uh, to make this presentation. So with that, I am done. <laughs> thank you so much, Joe. We're getting a lot of enthusiastic thanks and, and some LOLs, you know, I'll just let you know that someone is saying, Joe is a treasure and a delight. So, you know, as far as we're concerned, you can take the rest of the day off oh, after Thanks. After you answer just a few questions That's that came in. Nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. For me. Thank you, everybody. I always enjoy talking to talking about my favorite uh, my favorite subject here. There's three questions and I'll check the chat afterwards. Are there any other influencers in this area besides Brian Garner and you? Christopher Baumford? Yes. Um, you mean lawyers? I'm assuming the person meant lawyers, yes, yeah, or Ross, legal Ross, writing. Ross Guberman, uh, although he doesn't advertise himself as a plain language. Now I'm going to leave, the problem is I'm going to leave people out and I'm going to regret it. Um, but Ross Guberman, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't identify himself as a plain language person, but that's where his, that's, that's what he, what he, what he teaches, the broad mm -hmm. view of, of plain language. Um, oh, geez. Uh, I, I should get up and go look at my bookshelf, but those, <laughs> those are, those, oh, Peter Butt in Australia, Mark Adler, uh, who isn't as active anymore as he used to be, but uh, so there are lots of lawyers. And as I, as I said during my talk, um, mm -hmm. lots of legislative, lots of legislative drafters. Eamon Moran, who was the president of Clarity, former president of Clarity. Uh, so there are, Peter Butt has written a wonderful book called, uh, called uh, Modern Legal Drafting. So we're out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Not, not well, a, not a. That I didn't, I'm sorry for all those I didn't think of. I know there are more than that. Well, should, should it come to you that, that you find, you know, that you have a, created a list, you can send it to me and I'll send it to the plain community. Good idea. Oh, another one is Michelle Asprey, who's okay. written Plain Language for Lawyers, now in its fourth edition. See, I'm just, I'm going to feel guilty. <laughs> well, that's the problem with expertise. It gets jumbled up with some of the other things. Yeah, I'm, doing um, it, I'm doing it off the top of my head. I will say that in my, in my first book, Lifting the Fog of Legalese, one of the appendixes has a, uh, a plain language bookshelf. Okay. Uh, with, with references to, you know, in another, well, yes, the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, mm -hmm. The Plain English Handbook is great for a download, along with the Federal Plain Language Guidelines, um, which m may not have been written by lawyers, but so there's lots of good sources out there available on the internet as well. And we have, of course, some things listed on plainlanguage.gov under resources right. and articles and books as well. Um, another, another question is, how can interested non-lawyers help with these legal plain language efforts? <clears throat> um, let me just mention one other person, Richard Whitick, who wrote, play, was one of the original books on the subject, Plain English for Lawyers, um, now in his fifth or I think sixth edition. So again, there's, there's lots. How can non-lawyers help? Well, put lawyers' feet to the fire from time to time. 
if you're in a position to do it. I mentioned earlier when you when a lawyer tells you that, um, well, uh, th th these this language is required by statute. A ask respectfully for a citation to that statute or that regulation, and look it up and see if it really does require. It. And have you've got this little you know to the extent that they make it, these other kinds of excuses and rationalizations. So you can say, well, what about Kimball said uh, here that, uh, that maybe that's not necessarily true and lots of other people do. And so be able to know your stuff. Right, it's always easier to start the conversation. Right. And one last question before I go back and check the chat. How do you know when to write like, and I'm putting this in quotations, how do you know when to write like real people talk as opposed to writing with correct grammar. Our audience is primarily teachers. I think you should write with correct grammar. I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's nothing inconsistent between writing, you know, you say correct. I mean, th th this, is a, this is somewhat loaded, this whole idea of standard English. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you should distract your reader with, uh, with, with, usage that is not more or less even though even though, even the language around this is, is is difficult more or less standard or conventional um and know, and know your but you have to know your audience you know if you think your audience is you know like a judge is going to be bothered by contractions then maybe don't use uh, contractions in legal writing although good writers good legal writers do um, and so I'm trying to remember what the, what the original question was. <laughs> well, I how, think how it's a we, question of... Write, yeah, how, do, how do we write like people talk and mm -hmm. still, um, and still y y use so-called correct grammar? Well, you should use so-called correct grammar or you're going to distract your reader. You know, unless you know that your reader is a, uh, someone who doesn't care about that sort of thing. There's nothing, there's nothing inconsistent with writing, uh, with writing in plain language. And in fact, plain language should be written in, uh, in a way that you would call correct or conventional or standard. Uses, uses proper, you can, you can imagine the battle we had over hyphens on the, some of the federal rules. Uh, but it, yeah, I can actually it uses, correct. Yes. It uses it uses so-called conventional punctuation, spelling, usage, and style. And one final question, which is a great compliment, as we'll we'll send you some of the messages. Do you want um, people to send? Let's see. If people have questions, do you want them to go through plainlanguage.gov and we'll just forward them to you? Or do you want to have them email you directly? Whichever is easiest. I'm fine with you sending me an email. Okay. If you have questions or thoughts? Uh, let me, let me put that. that in, we'll be right let, there me, in the... let me put your email in the okay. chat box and people can easily email you themselves if they like. There. That's well, it. that is, thank you so much. There's a lot of enthusiasm on this, on this uh, Zoom chat for, for what you've been talking about and uh, the ideas you've brought up. Well, good. Well, thank you, Catherine. And thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your attention. I've enjoyed it.